The official 1990 NCAA championship video is brought to you by Rawlings, makers of the official ball for NCAA basketball championships. <laughs> I came to the Final Four saying to myself, I want to experience the Final Four and I want to be involved in it. But this year I'm coming to the Final Four thinking I'm in the Final Four to win basketball games. It's just great and I just want to enjoy every bit of it because it's a once in a lifetime thing. You know, I'm just happy to be here. Our main goal was to get here. And now that we're here, you know, we feel that the pressure is off of us and we can just go out and try to play a good ball game and uh, win a national championship. If you're fortunate enough to make it, you can just cherish it the rest of your life. And it's, it's more than just basketball in the final four. You get, you get the feeling that if we go for it and really play 110%, I feel we already won simply because that's, that's all you can do. Rocky Mountain Magic, the official 1990 NCAA championship video. It all comes down to one weekend. One weekend full of color and pageantry and emotion and talent. As an event, the Final Four stands by itself as the finest spectacle in collegiate sport. But in reality, it is the end of a 64-team quest for supremacy. A quest that begins in arenas all across America in the middle of March and winds up every year at the Final Four. The teams that gathered in Denver for 1990's Final Four struggled long and hard to get there. In a tournament that may be looked back upon as the greatest ever, each team dug down deep to survive. For some, the 1990 Final Four was a coming out party. For others, it was the end of the line. But for everyone who participated, it was definitely a time that will not easily be forgotten. Obviously, not every team gets to the Final Four. Along the way, there are 60 others that see their dreams shattered. Some go home with stunning swiftness. Others stick around much longer than expected. In the NCAAs, the pressure of one loss and you're out always seems to be a great equalizer. And this year was no different. They'll come through Davis, and he'll come to Fox. Fox comes down the baseline and hits it. Carolina wins it. Carolina upsets OU. Oh, oh, Mike Spicer on the inbound. Yes. McCray. Yes. Unable to get inside. Oh, Newby. In 1990, there was so much talent on the court that winning just one game in the tournament became a tremendous accomplishment. No lead, no matter its size, was safe. No team, no matter its ranking, was immune from upset.
Xavier knocks off the three seed, Georgetown. UCLA leads by one. Rick Calloway has come in, the offensive gun. He can beat you off the dribble. Now there are three seconds to go. Calloway fires it up, misses. The rebound, Gilder. The game's over. UCLA wins in an upset. wants to do is get the ball in. When the clock starts, when somebody touches it and Kaufman intercepts it, P.J. Bowman, no, he don't think, I don't think he got the shot off anyway. He did not. And so Dayton will win it, 88-86. They won't call a timeout. They'll take it up. Rebound, Spencer. Without a doubt, the most miraculous moment in the 1990 tournament came in a sweet 16 game between Connecticut and Clemson. Down by 19 points midway through the second half, Clemson rallied to take a one-point lead with 10 seconds remaining. Connecticut's Tate George then missed an opportunity to give the Huskies the lead. And when the Tigers, Sean Tyson grabbed the rebound and was fouled, the game appeared to be over. But Tyson would miss the free throw, and with one second left, Connecticut had another chance. There was, however, one slight problem. They were 94 feet away. One second left. Burrell takes the ball, looking inbound, loops it far up court for George, who catches it, turns around, shoots, and he got it! He made it! He hit the shot! And the Huskies have won it! The Huskies have won it! George hits the shot on the right side of the lane! And UConn wins it 71 to 70! Each year, it somehow seems that with every tournament loss, another great career comes to an end. In 1990 was no different. All Americans like Lionel Simmons of LaSalle, Gary Payton of Oregon State, and Louisiana State University's Chris Jackson never even made it past the early rounds. Their places in the tournament draw were taken by less heralded players from less heralded teams like Robert Ory of Alabama, Trevor Wilson of UCLA, and Tyrone Hill of Xavier all of whom led their teams into the Sweet 16. With all its excitement and drama, there was still one team, one player, one story, which dominated the first 10 days of this NCAA tournament. Just one week before the tournament began, Hank Gathers of Loyola Marymount collapsed and died while playing in a game. Loyola then played the opening weekend of the tournament in a condition that guard Jeff Fryer called an emotional hurricane. The Lions swept to two wins, including a 149-115 thrashing of defending champion Michigan. The most poignant moment of the Lions' eventual run to the final eight was when Bo Kimball made good on his promise to shoot his first free throw of every game left-handed. Left-handed in honor of his friend, Hank Gavin. Sometimes we tend to lose sight of the things that really matter, but in both victory and defeat, Bo Kimball and Loyola Marymount brought us back to reality. The Lions did not make the Final Four, but they taught the country a lesson in grace and courage that will long be remembered. When all was said and done, four teams found their way to Denver. From the East came Duke. After crushing Richmond in the first round, the Blue Devils fell behind St. John's before overtaking the Redmond 76-72 and then had to rally again in the regional semifinals before beating UCLA 90-81. However, Duke took cunning from behind to an extreme in the regional final against Connecticut. Coming off their unbelievable win in the previous round against Clemson, the number one seeded Huskies were definitely on a roll. Keyed by the play of reserve guard John Gwynn, Connecticut took a five-point lead down the stretch and looked to be headed to Denver. But Duke rallied behind the shooting of senior guard Phil Henderson and barely missed a shot that would have won the game in regulation. Oh, 
Hurley's lob, Abdelabi, goes off the rim, and we're going to overtime. But they had a chance. Then in overtime, with Duke trailing 78-77, with less than three seconds left, the Devils turned the tables on the Huskies, who just the game before had won on a last-second shot. The UConn not playing the passer. All right, here is Leitner with the shot, and it scores! And Duke wins! It was onward to Denver for Christian and his fellow soldiers, where they would meet Arkansas, which had survived the Midwest. In round one, the Razorbacks just got by the Princeton Tigers and then met Dayton, who after beating Illinois, almost got its second upset. He is number 10, swings inside with the top of the circle, not there, gets his own rebound and puts it in. Three seconds to go, and time out. Howard throws it up high, ball is free, Arkansas and Manson. It'll be Arkansas and North Carolina with an appointment in Dallas. Next came a pull-away win over North Carolina, then a down-to-the-wire affair with Southwest Conference rival Texas. In a region filled with upsets, Texas had surprisingly gotten to the round of eight. Early in the second half, Arkansas raced out to a big lead, but the Longhorns held on, and led again by Travis Mays, they rallied down the stretch, coming within one three-point shot of tying the game. In the end, Arkansas proved to be too tough, and the Razorbacks raced on to the Final Four. In the Southeast, the rambling wreck from Georgia Tech had an easy time with East Tennessee State in the first round, but then came a down-to-the-wire win over LSU, followed by a controversial overtime victory against Michigan State. Kenny Anderson's miraculous shot forced the overtime, but many Michigan State fans will always argue he did not beat the buzzer. Georgia Tech held on to win in overtime and then faced Minnesota in the regional finals. Coming off their spectacular win, Georgia Tech might have had enough momentum to run all the way to Denver, but the Golden Gophers were playing about as well as anyone in the country. In the previous round, Minnesota had upset Syracuse, and now, led by Willie Burton, they found themselves on the verge of pulling off yet another upset. The game went back and forth until Kenny Anderson and Dennis Scott took control down the stretch. Still, Minnesota hung on and had a chance to win with the final shot of the game. They need at least a two to tie. Kevin Lynch out of the corner. Georgia Tech on the way to Denver. The only number one seed to make it to Denver was the University of Nevada at Las Vegas. The running Rebels ran right by Arkansas Little Rock in round one and then ousted Ohio State in the second round. Ball State, however, nearly sent the Rebels running right out of the tournament. His hands, the low, and it goes it away, and UNLV has won it. UNLV goes to the regional final. After squeaking by Ball State, only Loyola Marymount's up-tempo game stood in UNLV's way. Early on, it was clear that the Rebels considered it a challenge to be playing the tournament's sentimental favorites, and they pulled out to a big lead. Unfortunately for them, Loyola never found its rhythm, and the inspired Rebels simply sped past the Lions on their way to Denver, 131 to 101. The four hottest teams in college basketball had gathered to decide 1990's national champion. And amid all the mile-high madness in Denver, the folks at McNichols Arena got ready to host the show.
the day before the semifinal games, all four teams came to McNichols to practice. And more than 16,000 fans came out to the practice as the teams put on quite a show. On Saturday, a welcome dose of Denver's famous crisp and clear weather heralded the arrival of the biggest day in college basketball. <laughs> Semi-final Saturday at the Final Four, and outside McNichols Arena, it might have been hard to get a ticket, but it was easy to catch the fever. who were able to get in were about to be treated to a full afternoon of college basketball's greatest show. Starting with the first semifinal of the day, the Southwest Conference's Arkansas Razorbacks against the Duke Blue Devils from the Atlantic Coast Conference. Despite having never won a national championship, both Arkansas and Duke were no strangers to the Final Four, especially the Blue Devils, who were making their third straight appearance. Let's go, one, two, three, defense! Let's go, Duke! Let's go, baby! Let's have some fun! On the other side, Arkansas had not been to the Final Four since 1978. It was also the first appearance for Razorback coach Nolan Richardson, who nonetheless knew exactly what his team had to do to win. I think the most important key for us is to play hard. Uh, we've got to play hard in order for other things to work. But taking care of the basketball, I think, is going to be very important for both teams simply because they play half-court pressure defense, and we certainly play a full-court pressure defense. Arkansas's pressure game was potentially dangerous to Duke. But like Richardson, Duke coach Mike Krzyzewski fully understood the key to the game. I think offensively, we certainly have to break their press and not turn the ball over and we have to break it to score. When we don't break it, or they're allowed to set up their half-court uh, offense, I think we have to take advantage of big people inside, even though they're playing zone against us. Once the game began, it didn't take long to prove Krzyzewski a prophet. Within a span of two minutes, Duke did everything their coach asked for and jumped out to an eight to nothing lead. turn, shoot, score! Bobby looks it quickly in the middle. Ola takes a step, lays it up, and he's fouled on the play. The Blue Devils' early explosion left the Razorbacks stunned. But with Richardson urging his team on, Todd Day responded with a three-pointer for Arkansas's first points of the game. Duke, however, continued to press on. And when Bobby Hurley found Ala Abdel Nabi for a dunk and Christian Leitner freed Phil Henderson, the Devils had a 16-5 lead just five minutes into the contest. All week, Arkansas had talked about the need to shut down Duke guard Bobby Hurley. But in the game's first few minutes, Hurley had effectively handled the Razorbacks' pressure. About the only thing Hurley did have trouble with was the flu. Soon after Duke's early surge, Hurley left the game. And although he returned a few minutes later, a weakened Hurley was one reason why Arkansas was able to get back into the flow of the game. Fortunately for Mike Krzyzewski, Hurley quickly settled down. And with its primary ball handler back on track, Duke maintained its double-digit lead. However, this would prove to be a game of streaks. And with the Razorbacks down 25-15 with 10 minutes left in the half, they would mount a comeback.
led by both Todd Day and Lindsey Howell, Arkansas outscored Duke 21-11 over an eight-minute span and eventually tied the score at 36 with just three minutes left in the first half. Arkansas was happy to be playing the game at its pace, but the Devils wouldn't back down. And when Phil Henderson hit his first three-pointer of the afternoon, Duke again led by four. By now, the Arkansas running game was operating at full speed, and it didn't take them long to tie the game again. But the Blue Devils scored the half's final three points to lead at the intermission 46-43. Arkansas had weathered its poor start to get back into the game. But when the second half got underway, Duke came out flying once more. Like it did in the first half, Duke scored eight straight points and led 54-43 just three minutes and 20 seconds into the second half. Arkansas was on the verge of being run out of the arena, but in this game of streaks, it just marked the Razorbacks' turn to put together a run. In just over a minute and a half, the Razorbacks poured in nine straight points. Then, with 13 minutes left, in Arkansas trailing by four, Duke star Christian Leitner committed his fourth foul of the game. Todd Day's three-point play not only sent Leitner to the bench, it also brought the Razorbacks to within a point of Duke. With its fans fired up and Leitner out of the lineup, Coach Nolan Richardson watched as his Razorbacks continued their charge. After giving up the first eight points of the half, the Razorbacks outscored the Devils 24-8 and took a 69-62 lead on Ron Curie's three-point play midway through the second half. Just a year before at the Final Four, Duke had lost a big second-half lead to Seton Hall. And with Arkansas playing at the top of its game, history looked to be repeating itself. But for Duke, this year would be different. We were down by seven, and we inserted Christian back in the game with four fouls. And Christian's presence on the court, I think, turned the game around for us. Within a span of two minutes, Leitner helped Duke get back in the game. Just a short time before, the Devils were in serious trouble. But now, with Leitner leading the way, it was their turn to go on a streak. This time, it was an 11-2 run. And when it was through, the Blue Devils had not only regained the lead at 73-71, they also showed that they weren't about to quit. This is the time when you need to definitely uh, show your leadership because in you know, crunch time, uh, do or die, that's one dribble, keeps it over the left side to Bill Henderson. He'll take the three, buries it. Quickly jumps it off the right side to Henderson. Bill open, will take the three, got him! Plenty of time to set up. When a team is at its is at its peak in a game, they're playing their best. They're they're getting everything they want off of their press. Is what they uh, they live and die by that press in, in a sense. And then we turn it around, and that was definitely the turning point of the game. Henderson and his game-high 28 points put Duke ahead 89-81. And now, with four minutes remaining, it was time to see if Arkansas had another spurt left. But this time, there would be no Razorback reply. Their shots just wouldn't fall. All that Duke needed to do now was to control the basketball something that was not lost on Bobby Hurley's father as he watched his son lead his team to the championship game. Keep that clock running. Keep that clock running. Yes, it's over. It's over. Monday night. Corner. Here's the jumper, off glass, no good. Ricky with the rebound, game's over. Duke wins it, mighty shovel for 83, and the Blue Devils go 
will play for the national championship on Monday night here in Denver, Colorado. In a game of streaks, Duke simply had the final one. Over the last five minutes, the Blue Devils outscored the Razorbacks 19 to four. Duke's triumph was definitely a team effort, but a great deal of the credit had to go to the freshman Bobby Hurley, who played 36 minutes despite having the flu. And as Coach Krzyzewski hoped he would, continually broke Arkansas's press in the Blue Devils' 97-83 victory. The second national semifinal had Georgia Tech from the ACC challenging UNLV from the Big West. Take a position, gentlemen. Door's about to open. This is a great group of kids. I, I, I love our team. I love our kids. They play real hard. And that's the way we want them to play. We, we, we want our kids to be very aggressive defensively. Defensively inside, we got to somehow maintain. We can't stop. We got to maintain their inside power. Well, definitely just a you know, collapse on the inside, but whenever coach wants us to play defense, we definitely have to play hard, you know, contain them and help out inside. We've, we faced a lot of inside players, you know, Clemson, Duo, and LSU Duo, so it's not like we've never faced, you know, great inside players before, but we know Larry Johnson, you know, the best big man inside. We just have to help out and just do the things we've been doing all year to get here. What both Georgia Tech and UNLV had been doing all year was running. And even though each team knew what it had to do defensively to win, in the game's early going, the fans were treated to the offensive show they had all come to see. With the pregame talk behind them, the two teams simply decided to do what they do best, run. Way down in the paint, lays it up and in. Nice move by Oliver. That's where he's at his best, takes the ball through bad. Long pass to Hunt, drives under, open it. Six, one and a half, but he really crammed it in there. 30 all, long three, good by Scott at the other end. Up and down the court they went. And with each team scoring almost at will, both Jerry Tarkanian and Bobby Crimmins could not have been all that pleased with their team's defenses. Offense, though, was another story. Throughout the first half, both teams shot nearly 70% from the floor. The Rebels were led by Larry Johnson. While to Tarkanian's dismay, Tech was able to control the game's tempo thanks to freshman guard, Kenny Anderson. I love running, and I'm a point guard, so when I get the ball, I'm running. And I know Dennis Scott and Brian Allen, they love running, so offensively, we just have to play Georgia Tech style of basketball, which we've been doing all year, run t running type of game, and then, you know, we can slow it up at times too, but we want to keep our running game going. Keeping a running game going in Denver's thin air meant plenty of substitutions for both teams. And when UNLV went to its bench midway through the first half, UNLV paid the price. The pace was exhausting. Two teams with similar styles and similar personnel going at each other for 20 minutes up and down the full 94 feet of the court. It was simply exhilarating. The game had turned into the scoring explosion everyone had expected. But because both teams were playing so well offensively, neither UNLV nor Georgia Tech was able to pull away. And for nearly all of the first half, the two teams stayed within three points of each other. Just as it had wanted to, UNLV was able to go inside to its center, David Butler. Then, too, UNLV would not be called the running rebels if they were standing still. Toward the end of the first half, Georgia Tech slowly began to pull away. The key man was Dennis Scott, 
who finished the first half with four three-pointers on his way to 20 points in the first 20 minutes. Here's to Scott, long three, yes. And a long three that was. Woo. He's still moving, he's still moving. Pulls up, 12-footer, got it. He is red hot too. Kenny Anderson's basket just before the half left UNLV down seven. But the Rebels still weren't worried, although they hadn't trailed by that much all tournament long. The main thing is that no one gets down whether or not they're shooting well or playing well because there are other facets that are just as important, if not more important, than just shooting. And also, that, that brings about the fact that if a guy isn't having as good of a game as he normally would, somebody else comes to the forefront. But the main thing is that no one gets down. Well, offensively, I think we just have to basically play our game, which is, you know, um, we go out, we just take the open side, and we try to get Anderson and, and Greg, try to free them guys up for the three-pointers, and, you know, basically we try to get the ball down low and just try to pound it and attack the basket, and we just have to go out and play our game. You know, Bobby's done a great job with his club. He utilizes those two postmen, the three to three scorers. And, you know, everybody talks about lethal weapon three, but, you know, it'd be a lot more fun guarding those guys if you didn't have to fight through those screens being set by those big guys all night long. Playing defense in an offensive game, it would be the key to a tense second half. Just as they had done all year long, the Rebels planned to use their frenetic man-to-man -man defense to get their offense going. And at the beginning of the second half, their strategy began to pay off. UNLV came out of the locker room intent on following its plan. The result was a patented Rebel run. During the first half, the, the altitude bothered us a little bit. But during the second half, when we came out, the coach told us that they was beating us back, and we the running Rebels. We, we shouldn't have been get, getting beat back, so we decided to pick up the defense another notch and got our running game going, and, you know, that was the turning point in the game in the second half. Much of the credit for the Rebels' post-halftime spurt went to Stacy Augman and the superb defensive job he performed on Dennis Scott. It's hard, you know, the first minute, you're looking for your second win, and your, 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 your throat is burning, it's really burning. But then after a while, you, you kind of get used to it, you know. I saw a um, little fatigue settling on Scott, and I really tried to get into him and bother him. You know, I didn't say too much to him, but I saw in his eyes that he was very tired, and I jumped right into him. Augman not only jumped right into Scott, he also jumped right over Georgia Tech. No matter the altitude, we're going to get out there and run. And I know we're all going to play hard. You know, that's, that's, a, that's automatic, you know, when we step on the court, that we're going to go out and play hard defense. The Rebels' hard work paid off at the beginning of the second half, and by the time Anderson Hunt hit his third three-pointer of the game, they had outscored Tech 10-1. to Bobby Crimmins had seen his team's halftime lead evaporate, and now with UNLV in the lead, he knew exactly what Georgia Tech had to do. It's time for us to put together our best game. You know, we might be running out of luck. We've got to put together a great performance by everybody. Unfortunately for Crimmins, Tech's luck was about to run out. With 11 minutes left, Kenny Anderson picked up his third foul of the second half. It was his fourth of the contest. It could not have come at a worse time. After controlling Georgia Tech's offense, the brilliant freshman point guard would have to leave the game. UNLV tried to take advantage of Georgia Tech's predicament right away. With Anderson out of the lineup, the Rebels felt confident they could open up the court and run right by the Yellow Jackets. For a while, Tech responded to the challenge. But soon, with Anderson on the bench, UNLV began to stretch its lead. Whips it outside. Hunt goes. Anthony for a three. Yes. Without its quarterback to direct the attack, Georgia Tech began to force its shots, and the Rebels took advantage. With just under seven minutes left, UNLV was up by seven. 
and then Larry Johnson committed his fifth foul. Sensing that this might be his last opportunity, Crimmins went straight to Anderson. And Kenny once again showed why, in this game, he was the one player Georgia Tech could not afford to lose. The game had reached its critical point. Georgia Tech had closed it within a couple of baskets. And the next team that could put together a run would likely win it. For a while, it looked like Georgia Tech would be that team. But after Tarkanian steadied the Rebels, Anderson Hunt hit his fifth three-pointer of the game to give UNLV a five-point lead. Georgia Tech managed to hang in until the end. But ultimately, UNLV's relentless defensive pressure had stung the Yellow Jackets. Appropriately enough, the last basket of the game came off a UNLV fast break. Ninety eighty one as she makes it. It's all over. Just the shouting. Here's a blocked a pass. Goes inside. Put up. No good. And the game is over. And as the shot was missed, it sends UNLV into the national championship game against Duke on Monday night as Nevada Las Vegas defeats Georgia Tech. On a floor filled with offensive stars, it was defense that won the game. In the second half, both Dennis Scott and Kenny Anderson were so frustrated by UNLV's intense pressure, they shot a combined four for 14 from the floor. And the Rebels took advantage to power their way to a 90-81 win. Sunday was a day of rest, not only for the players, but for the fans of the two winning teams as well. Many spent the day admiring the sights around Denver. So when Monday afternoon came around, their vocal cords were well rested. The championship game matchup guaranteed college basketball would have a first-time champion. And UNLV and Duke were both ready for the challenge. Well, we have to keep good pressure on the ball. We have to do the best job we possibly can on Henderson. He's a great player. And, and their two inside people are really good. Uh, the, I think they're really underrated. I think those two kids inside are very, very good. With their perimeter pressure, they make you turn your back when you have the ball. And it's kind of like rushing a quarterback in football where you can't see all his receivers. That's what they try to do, and uh, they do a good job of it. It starts with our defense, you know. Our defense is our offense, and if we get our defense and our start our breaks, you know, I think we have a good chance to win this game. They're the type of team that can, you know, make a 15-2 run on you and then rest for a minute and give you another 15-2 run. And that's something we have to be really careful about. We will be confident. Uh, we'll be loose. Um, and I think we'll play real hard. I don't think we'll beat ourselves. I really, I, I feel that it's going to, I think it's two re really even teams, and I think whichever one plays the best game uh, is going to win the game, because I think, uh, I think our ball clubs are very similar. I think we're very even, and uh, whoever has the best game and gets the right balance of the ball. Unlike its semifinal game in which it scored the first eight points of each half, Duke found the early going tough against UNLV. But at the other end of the court, it was a different story. Greg Anthony hit the Rebels' first jumper of the game. And after another Duke miss, UNLV was off and running. 
Butler beats him to it, and it's a three on two for Vegas. Here's a bounce in low to Johnson. He puts it in. Right from the start, it was clear that Larry Johnson would be able to establish position inside. And for Duke, that meant trouble, as UNLV took an early 7-2 lead. The Devils hoped they could get inside, too. And for a time, they did. First, Christian Leitner found Ala Abdelnavi. And then Leitner hit Robert Bricky as Duke closed within a point at 7-6. For the first three minutes, Duke had played UNLV even, but all of that was about to change. With a 10 -footer, got it. Anderson Hunt started a scoring binge that would ignite the Rebel attack. At first, Hunt began his assault from outside, but after a while, there was no stopping him from anywhere. Worse still, the normally sure-handed Devils were having trouble handling the basketball. In the first 10 minutes, they turned it over 10 times. For Duke, this stretch was a nightmare. Nothing it did seemed to go Duke's way. While on the other end of the court, the Rebels could do no wrong. Led by their suffocating amoeba defense, UNLV completely took Duke out of its game, outscoring the Blue Devils 21-9. Hunt. Hunt fakes and drives. Baseline eight-footer in the air. Good. Young comes out, takes it in backcourt. He drives down, puts up a little hook shot. Got it. Left corner. Young puts it up and in for three. And that's what he can do. Very young. When their onslaught was over, the Rebels had taken a 34-19 lead with six minutes left in the half. But Duke hadn't come this far to pack it in. The Blue Devils began to look inside. It had worked earlier in the game, and for a while it worked again. A couple of baskets by Ala Abdelnavi got Duke back on track. But on this night, the Rebels were flying. And no sooner did Duke score than UNLV was dunking at the other end. Comes down into the paint, fires down on the line, very open, a two-hand dunk. Here's Anthony wide open for the... The Rebels were playing as well as they had all tournament long. And when Anthony hit this running jumper right before the half, UNLV took a 12-point lead into the locker room. Actually, trailing by only a dozen should have encouraged Duke, especially since it had basically ignored its own pregame plans and played right into UNLV's hands. I think it's important for us not to uh, race with UNLV. Uh, rather, us outsmarting them, I think, is something important. Us running good half-court offense. Uh, if we don't take control of the game at some point in that game, we end up getting blown out. Throughout the tournament, Duke had been able to come back from second-half deficits, and now the Blue Devils hoped it could happen once more. But the second half started just as the first had ended. And the first time the Rebels came down court, Larry Johnson hit his first three-pointer of the night. Whips it out, and here's Johnson for a three. Yes! At 50-35, to 35, UNLV had its biggest lead of the night. But Duke fought back, closing the gap to 11, and then found itself exchanging baskets with the Rebels for the first four minutes of the second half. Pass to Henderson, he was working to save it, dribbles it out, missed, it goes in. Anthony floating it in, the Butler gets it in, and he lays it in. And Hurley from his own end of the court into Leitner, 12-footer, good. Seven points for Leitner, and it's 52-41. Long pass, and going for the basket, layup, good by Hunt. Ah! Off anyway, and Davis puts it up and in, dances it in for the basket. Here's Johnson for another three, yes. Oh, oh, Ricky trying to drive, all going turkey. Leitner, 17-footer straight away, good. Left side to Hunt, Hunt fakes, drives to the baseline, 12-footer, bullseye, got it. At one point, Duke actually narrowed the UNLV lead to 57-47. But then, all of a sudden, it happened. And Phil Henderson's greatest fears were realized. Actually, it began innocently. Larry Johnson, 12-footer. And then Anderson Hunt hit his second three-pointer of the night. But when Stacy Augman led a fast break, which Hunt put the finishing touches on, the Rebels had outscored the Blue Devils 9 to nothing in just over a minute, taking a 19-point lead with 15 minutes left to play. And the running Rebels were only heating up. Do, 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 yeah. do, 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 do.
to From the tip off you could tell it was gonna be a blowout tonight They were slamming and a jamming and a burning up the floor left and right There was nothing that could stop them as they drove on down the lane And were going crazy you could hear them start to scream I got one in rebel fever burning up my mind I got running rebel fever burning up my mind. I got running rebel fever and it feels so fine. I don't need to see a doctor or stay in bed all day. Only thing I need is just to watch those rebels play. I got running rebel fever burning up my mind. I got running rebel fever. I got wrong in rebel fever. I got wrong When the rebels had finished running, they had scored an astounding 18 consecutive points in a little less than three minutes, building an insurmountable 75-47 lead with 13 minutes left as UNLV simply dominated Duke in every aspect of the game. The loss and the manner in which it happened was a bitter pill for Duke to swallow. It had played so well for so long, and now on a night when they had a chance to win it all, the Blue Devils had come up empty. Meanwhile, UNLV came to Denver and found Rocky Mountain Magic. Just counting the seconds off the clock to a national championship. Two seconds, one second. It's a shot at the buzzer, no good. The game is over. Nevada Las Vegas wins the first championship in its history. The NCAA crowd and the Duke Blue Devils once again denied the glass slipper. Nevada Las Vegas 103, Duke 73, and the running Rebels celebrate and whoop it up here in the Mile High City, Denver, Colorado. Led by tournament most viable player, Anderson Hunts, game high 29 points, the newly crowned champions of college basketball had put on an awesome performance. In 40 minutes of explosive basketball, the running rebels of UNLV had scored the most points ever in a championship game and won by the largest margin in championship game history. Theirs was truly a championship to savor. I don't need to see a doctor or stay in bed all day. Only thing I need is just to watch some troubles play. I got one in red fever. I got one in 